2009, I got my first rental. By 2018, I had nine doors. By 2019, I had 35 doors. By 2020, I had 105. Um, and now I'm at 108 doors. And 2009, I made like 10,000 a year in annual rent. Now I make over 100,000 a month in annual rent. So it's been quite a journey to just be able to help my family and also just grow from being, uh, having a negative network. Two, one. Welcome to House Rich, a real estate show. We talk to average people that have done above average things in real estate. Today we have KR, real estate investor and founder of KJ Consultants. We're going to talk about his journey from working at Goldman Sachs to uh, getting to the point now where he has his own property management company, um, 100 plus rentals and has his family working for him. So uh, um, going to learn about that, um, how to manage properties and a, a lot of cool stuff during this episode. So appreciate you joining me. Could you introduce yourself to the, uh, the good folks here? Well, first of all, uh, thanks for having me on your platform. I'm excited to share my story. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia with six siblings and a single, single parent household. My mother raised us. We were on welfare. For people that don't know what that is, that's the EBT card. And we had housing insecurity. We had food insecurity. No one told me that you're supposed to move 18 times before you turn 18, but that was my situation oh, wow. where we, at one point, we lived on one block, 50th of Walton. We lived on the uneven side and on the uneven number side, and then we moved to 56th of Walton, just for an example. I remember living in a studio apartment with 15 people where we had, uh, we had a hot plate, no stove. We had one bed. We had rats and roaches. We had love. We had a, 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 a tub but we had no shower. And right. so people grew, I pretty much represent my community. I'm community made, not self-made. So I went to public school, worked my butt off, got a scholarship, went off to Bowdoin College, then worked in investment banking. Then I was able to start investing in 2009. I got my first rental. By 2018, I had nine doors. By 2019, I had 35 doors. By 2020, I had 105. Um, and now I'm at 108 doors and 2009, I made like 10,000 a year in annual rent. Now I make over a hundred thousand a month in annual rent. So mm -hmm. it's been quite a journey to just be able to help my family and also just grow from being, uh, having a negative net worth to being a multimillionaire. So that's my story in a nutshell. Oh, okay. Awesome. And so, um, I want to start from the, um, beginning sort of fast forward a little bit. Um, so you kind of talk about your, your, um, you know, the environment you grew up in. I uh, know you went to, um, forgot what college you mentioned, but I know it was a good, good college, and then you eventually got into to Goldman Sachs. So what, what got you there? Because a lot of times you hear folks is like, um, you know, I grow up in a, in a rough environment, and, you know, you make um, bad choice X, Y, or Z. What, what, what got you on that path to the point you got a scholarship and were working on Goldman Sachs? What do you think led to that? Well, actually, I was a knucklehead in middle right. school. Um, <laughs> right. Where I recall uh, smoking weed and cigarettes and, drinking Coke 45, Mad Dog 2020, like in fifth grade, sixth grade, stuff like that, seventh grade. So I was just living a life. I remember trying out for track and the track, we went outside, the track coach said, y'all got to run around a block. I said, yo, ain't nobody got time for that. And I quit. <laughs> um, I remember just missing school and hooking in and just being disobedient when you have like so many siblings. But what really happened that really sparked um, a change, which was the emphasis was that my mother was exhausted and she made us go spend time with my stepdad. And I remember him sitting us down and talking to, talking to us, in particular to me, and say, don't be an F up like your mother and I and some of your siblings. So I have siblings who were parents and they were teenagers. They got pregnant like at 14 and 15. Mm -hmm. And so, and we were always struggling. And so he was saying, don't do as I do. Uh, what I need you to do is do what I say, because he said he knew what it took, but he never applied himself fully. And so I started to pay attention to my surroundings. And I said, look, am I going to end up uh, a dad as a teenager? Am I going to replace the homeless man? Am I going to replace the crack kid? And am I going to replace the school teacher? Am I going to replace the bus driver? Am I going to rep replace the doctor? I decided to replace the landlord the business owner, because the landlord got to decide when we pay rent and when we get to move in and when we leave. And so I'm like, yo, he always in our business. I wanted to be in a position where I was the person who determined when people come and go on my property. 
And so at a young age, at 14, I started to immerse myself in books about wealth management and real estate because I noticed my church loved my community and always struggled and had a building fund. I noticed that my parents loved us, but always struggled and my siblings. So I want to know what does it take to become successful, to create financial independence? Um, and so I started to immerse myself in a whole new world where I went from hating track and not applying myself in middle school to graduate in valedictorian in high school and becoming school president, class president. It was a full 180. And it was interesting because one of my friends in my autograph book in eighth grade, I was so excited. I said, all these people wrote my book and I went home and read it and opened it up. And long and behold, one of my friends said, I can't believe you made it. I said, damn, you didn't think I was going to make it out of middle school? Oh my <laughs> God. Thank God I turned my life from real. Thank you. What, what were some of those those books you started to read that kind of helped change your, your mindset? And so I started to, first thing I, I for me, I start reading the Bible. The other thing is I start reading biographies about like the House of Morgan, about uh, Goldman Sachs, about Morgan Stanley. I start reading um, Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, uh, books by Peter Lynch. And so I started to just immerse myself in a, in a variety of books. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. And so what was the plan when you graduated college? Because I assume the plan was, or maybe it was, was the plan to get into real estate at some point? Or what was the plan when you graduated so college? So the plan was always to get into real estate since I was 14. Okay. And so I was not position driven. I was purpose driven. Okay. And so my purpose was to fully achieve what I call the three C's. One is intellectual capital, where you educate yourself in school and out of school. The other one is financial capital, where you learn how to how capital works in America, because we live in a capitalist society, and also how to make money. And then the third one was social capital, where you serve on boards and different committees where you can affect change in people's lives. So I wanted to get those three things, those three C's under, under my belt. And okay. then I said, I wanted to start to understand how the world works. So I worked on Wall Street. And I started to save money and bought my first rental in my mid-20s um, after I saved enough money from my scholarships and from down payments. And that's how it all started. So I always had that mindset that I was going to get in real estate long term because I, I, I had used to say I want to retire at 45. So I, I hit that number at 37. So I was very happy. Oh, okay, awesome. And so, um, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010, rough time in the housing market. What made you say, hey, um, I'm, I'm diving in? Why everybody's diving out? So after I left Goldman Sachs, I went to go work for um, a $3 billion long share equity hedge fund. And I was responsible for UK home builders and US home builders and European and US financials. So my job was to analyze publicly traded home builders stocks on uh, in the US and also in the UK. And so I started to understand them from an institutional investor point of view. So I learned how to analyze read 10 Ks and 10 Qs financial statements, interact with the management team, and so built models. And so that gave me um, a window into how that world worked. So I, I coupled my Wall Street experience analyzing home builders with my personal ambition to become a real estate investor. And that's why I got started in 09 and felt confident because I know the world was coming to an end, but I understood that I wasn't in, in investing based on emotion. I was investing based on the numbers. So I always say fall in love with the numbers, not with the emotion. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. And um, just, just, just for, for a layman that maybe doesn't have any um, real estate expertise, but what's, what's some quick tips or maybe some long tips on, on analyzing like a deal. And so for, for us, what we do in my, in my course is we teach you, first of all, we believe you start with a macro level and then you work your way down to the micro. Okay. And so you first analyze the market. You want to analyze various things, whether crime, employment, things of that nature, analyzing the overall market, uh, how many citizens, the population, and then you work your way down to the individual deal. And then what you're going to start to do is see what the potential rent could be for that property. What is the purchase price? What is the rehab? Um, and so, that is something, that's how we approach it. We look at a macro level and then we go into detail on a micro level. And in my course, we explain key ratios that we may use, whether that is that you're, we think that if you're going to rehab a property, we like to do easy breezy cover girl houses. What we mean by that is not lipstick. Lipstick, you just paint over stuff. 
easy breezy cover girl houses. We take someone who may look rough like Queen Latifah when she first came out rapping mm-hmm. in the 80s and 90s, and we make we make Queen Latifah the way she is today as a cover girl. So we take a house, we fix like the bathroom, the kitchen, we do the floors over, we paint, we make it, you have a champagne experience and you pay liquor prices. Um, and so we say that we like to purchase something and 50% is our max for rehab. So if we bought something for a hundred, we only spent 50,000 on our rehab. So we're very selective. Um, so that's like one of the ratios that I like to use that I've been using since 2009. Oh, okay, thank you. So you talk about taking, um, looking at it from a macro level, analyzing the, the area. So if, if I'm in an area um, where this, I don't know, the numbers just don't work, it's a bad area for whatever reason, do you recommend like out of state investing or, or like out yes. of investing? So I've, I've, uh, when I started investing, <clears throat> I lived in Boston and I invested in Philadelphia. Okay. Um, so I own uh, 88 uh, units in the Philadelphia area and 20 units in the Harrisburg area. I've never lived in Harrisburg. Okay. So, and my students, they, my business partner, he lives in New York and invests in Indiana. My students invest in Maine, uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. My students invest all around the country. Um, and so I encourage people to be uh, agnostic when it comes to markets. You're just looking to apply uh, knowledge. I don't want you to think like you're a real estate pimp. You don't have to invest in a prostitute on the corner. You can go and find your investment in another state. So think about you've never been to a lot of people own Apple stock, but they've never been to Apple's headquarters. Mm -hmm. You don't have to visit the location to to determine if it's a good investment. I bought a 14 unit with a restaurant down below and five houses in Harrisburg. I've never seen any of them, but I'm confident in the management team and confident in my analysis to pick the right investment and go from there. So do you, but do you have like, like some sort of boots on the ground initially? Because, you know, sometimes things, even in, a, even in an area you're familiar with, like, you know, there's, there's different pockets that are that are good and bad. Do you do you recommend like having like boots on the ground at some point or just? No, I don't necessarily recommend that you have boots on the ground. What I recommend is that you first come up with a market analysis. Once you do the market analysis, then you start to assemble your team. So okay. in my course, we tell you, we give you a list of questions to ask the property manager, ask the real estate broker, to ask the lender, to ask the real estate agent. Um, and then you assemble the team. So first you got to get the market right. Then you invest time in putting together a team where you can Zoom people. You can do Zooms, you can do referrals, then you put your team together and then you decide to select the individual deal. But I don't want people starting to get hand, uh, foots on the ground all around the country and there's no deals there. That's a waste of time. Roger, Roger, Roger that make, makes sense. Uh, thank you. And so the first property you bought, was that, was that an investment property or was that... Good yes, people. all the all the properties I've never bought a personal residence. All my uh, properties were like uh, investment properties. Okay, so, so that's that was my approach. Um, and so I started with like first using like I always tell my students use credit unions first because they're not for profit organizations, so you'll get better terms on the financing and um, the requirements. They can customize it based on your need. So then you start with credit unions, then you go to small banks, then you go to mid sized banks, then you go to large banks. Um, because the larger banks are for profit. So therefore they're not going to be able to customize stuff. Things could be more generic um, unless you have a whole lot of money. And so I started with uh, individual houses because if it's an investment property and it is a a one unit, a single family, you could put down as low as 15%. If it is a duplex, triplex or fourplex in this investment property, you could put down 25%. And I started all my personal need because you get better terms in your personal name than you will if you start with an LLC. Oh, okay, thank you. Curious, do, do you you do you rent a property now, or have you moved into one of those those investment properties? Or what? I'm just curious. Do you do you rent or own your personal residence? So I, I have a uh, I rent, so I rent. Okay, okay. So I do own another house as well, uh, and I rent to my stepmom. So I rent and own, but primarily I just rent. Okay. And is that, is that, is that a mobility thing? Like, oh, I hear like Grant Cardone say, you know, don't, don't rent your primary residence. Is that just a mobility thing? Or just, I'm just, just genuinely curious. Um, well, I about- have a history. I had a history of moving around a lot for jobs. So I went to New York, Boston, all these different places. So I like to be free. Um, but I would tell individuals who are new investors, uh, if they have, if they can get an FHA loan, they should go for it. A duplex, triplex, fourplex. I think that's the easiest route. Um, for people who know that they like to jump around and you can afford it, you definitely should think about renting. 
Um, I think there are pros and cons. It just depends on your preference. Like some people know they want to stay located in a certain location. Some mm -hmm. people rent and they want to move around the whole city. They'll live in different parts of the city. Like I lived on, I lived on uh, various parts of Manhattan. And I live in the Bronx. So I've done, I moved around a lot. So it depends on your preference. Some people dislike moving. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And so you got the first, um, so you get the first property. How do you get to the point, or how do you get to the point where you're comfortable leaving your nine to five? Like how many properties or units do you have at, at that point? And how, and how do you kind of scale up? Um, so when, when I left my nine to five, I had 105 rental units. Okay. So um, that summer of like tw the summer of 2020, I pretty much bought 70 rental units during the pandemic. Oh, wow. Okay. So when I first invested in 2009, I bought one unit and I took my time getting up to nine units. In 2018, I got the nine units and people say, KR, you're moving too slow. I tell people, run your own race. Yeah. You're not competing against anybody else. You're competing against yourself. And so I kept my nine to five job so I can live off of that job. And then at all the rental income for like, let's say the first 10 years or nine years, just to make it simple, I can save the rental income. And I also can save the money from the cash out refis. And so therefore you have several hundred thousand dollars saved. Now you can start buying bigger properties. And so in 2020, that's why I went from uh, having nine properties in 2018 to having 35 properties and two, 35 doors in 2019, because I was able to save that big cash pile. And so you build up the confidence. The other thing I tell people is that things done well are done soon enough. And so if you are a security guard and you have to pay attention to 50 different screens at the same time, thieves are going to get by you. But yeah, if you yeah. only have one computer screen to focus on, you will pretty much catch that thief every time. And so during the first nine years, what I'm doing is what I focus on is the three R's. You're building a track record, you're building relationships, and you're building a reputation. So okay. the mere fact that you're mastering just one at a time on average, you're showing the lenders that you know what you're doing. You're showing your team you know what you're doing. You're showing the tenant you know what you're doing. You almost hitting a home run because you're so focused. And so over time, you're able to leverage the relationships and your reputation um, to open more doors and get better financing. So I wasn't in a rush. I think uh, I think excellence does not like speed. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Make, make, makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then so the housing market in 2020, 21 still, you know, it's kind of, kind of crazy. And so how do you go about finding like 70 deals in that, in that year? Are you going off market relationships? How, how do you find 70 deals uh, to be? Well, what's fascinating is you use a combination. <clears throat> and so we like to say at KJ Consulting is that we love blessings from everywhere. All right. So if you are a wholesaler and you got a good deal, hit me up. If you are in an MLS, uh, you're a regular agent and you got a good deal, hit me up. If you are a person and you want to, a seller, uh, owner want to sell their own property, hit me up. So what's fascinating is during that year, I bought deals multiple ways off the MLS and also off market. A lot of people say, oh, of course you can buy a big apartment building, you have the money. But I also bought five single family houses in Harrisburg for $37,000 a piece in August of 2020. Um, and they were on the same block and the owner just wanted to get out of them. So he sold me five houses for only $185,000. Already had a tenant on the inside. I didn't have to do anything on the inside or the outside. And I was able, I put down 30%. I was able to get 30% cash on cash return because there's always a situation when the sellers are they want to sell, whether they're going through a life-changing event, they're getting a divorce, they want to retire, they want to move to another climate, they're tired of fixing stuff up, they're tired of running the tent, managing a property, and so that's when I step in. So what a lot of people don't understand is just like Warren Buffett talks about, we all have access to the same information in terms of analyzing stocks. It's the same thing about deals on the MLS. We all see the same thing, but how do we analyze it? That will be the determining factor whether you can make money. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. And so, you know, ha having a uh, hundred plus units is one thing. Actually, probably managing 
um, the cost, the tenants, and, and all that. That's to, 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 totally different. Everything. It's, that's just hard to, easy to buy, but you can buy something, but to manage it is a whole different thing. So um, were you managing those properties? I know you have your own property management company now, but were you managing those properties yourself or who you were? Always, al always. I've always managed it by myself. So that's why I was saying that if you spend the first nine, 10 okay. years learning how to do property management with leases and evictions, all that stuff, you're going to be pretty good because you did the same thing for like a decade. So when you get bigger fish, you're going to be like, oh, I've done this. I've seen this. I've been down to city hall. I work with lawyers. I have systems and processes in place to make it to make it very easy for me to transition and scale. I don't I don't wait till I get to scale to learn how to put processes and systems together. I already started working on those, whether it's help having my stepmother help me run the business or my brother and give them responsibilities to start and using like apps like Buildium to try and figure out how do we make this business efficient so that I can take all the stuff I learned working on Wall Street, how they learn use systems and um, processes and leverage and relationships to run really lean organizations. You have a $3 billion hedge fund, you'll have like eight people running or five people running the whole fund, managing all that money. And so I started to take some of the best practices that I learned working um, on Wall Street and also going to an Ivy League um, business school, Dartmouth, uh, where I got my MBA. So I just use all those skills to put me in a position to win. Okay, thank you. What what's maybe um one or two tips you would say for being like a good a good property manager, you know, or that somebody would need to know to manage manage tenants? So what I would say is, if you're going to be a property manager, you have to figure out what's your personality. If okay. your personality is that you do not really like people, and surprisingly, a lot of people don't like people, <laughs> so therefore you should not be a property manager. Because you have to interact with people. And the other thing is to be successful, you got to have patience. So the way we approach the tenant is we perceive the tenant as someone who is really old, almost 100 years old, or someone that is an infant. So therefore, if someone is at the end of their lives, we have to be really patient with them and try to explain stuff to them. If someone is at the very beginning of their lives, we have to be very patient with them and gentle with them and try to understand them. So on both ends, our approach is to meet the tenants where they are. Okay. So a lot of people, they want the tenants. They don't, they don't take the time to understand what do the tenant want? Why is the tenant going through this situation? So we spend a lot of time screening the tenants and a lot of time working on patients and providing them with this champagne experience where they pay liquor prices. And what I mean by that is that you're giving them first class customer service. When they have issues, you fix those issues within 24 hours. When you, um, when you say that you're going to evict them, you are 100% professional and go through, use the law, all the steps that you're supposed to use to evict people are to file for possession of the property. You want to use everything that is professional so that they can perceive you as a first class organization versus a mom and pops or a bodega. Oh, okay, thank you. You talk, you talk about spending a lot of time screening the tenants, what, what are some tips or how do you go about screening uh, the tenants? Obviously, I know you do kind of do like a background check, but how do you actually, what else do so, you need to do to screen your tenants? So what we do is we do the typical background check and the credit and all those different things, criminal checks. But what we also do is I consider all my properties my children. Right. And so if I was going to leave my children at daycare, I'm going to do a lot of work analyzing that daycare center. So and the professionals that work there. So what we're going to do is we let you see our property. Now we're going to invite you to second rounds and we're going to ask to visit you and do an interview at the residence that's on your ID. Oh, wow, and okay. if you refuse to let us into your property, it's a no for us. You will not be able to move in. You got to check us out. Now we want to check you out. If you have dogs, cats, children, we want to meet the whole family. We want to use your bathroom. We want to see how you live it because these are my children. Okay. I'm not going to leave my children in someone's hands that I do not understand or trust. So if we go to your house and your porch is dirty or something looks really messed up, it's a no for us. Yeah, that's how they're going to treat your property. So yeah, it makes, I've literally never heard that, but that makes, that, makes, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of people don't do it because it requires a lot of resources. It requires money. So the big corporates don't want to pay someone to drive around wasting gas to go check someone's house out. Hmm. Okay, okay. Awesome. Um, And then so... What are some 
tips you would say for hiring the if you don't if you know if you're not a people person what are some tips for like hiring the pro, the right property manager you would say so in our course we actually lay out a bunch of questions in our approach to uh hiring the right property manager um but just on a high level we definitely make sure that we talk to locals we talk to previous customers and we do some other type of analysis so we feel comfortable with this particular person oh okay okay got it okay so um at what point did you, well, I guess you've always had the property management company, but at what point did you say, hey, you know, I want to, you know, um, hire my my family to help run? Like, do they, they run it? Or are you actively, I know you're involved, so but. My, my family, uh, my stepmom is responsible for single single families and my brother is responsible for um, for the apartment buildings. So okay. what, we, what we do is I believe in uh, transformational wealth. So we hear about generational wealth where I buy a property, then 40 years later, one of my family members will be inherit that and become wealthy. Instead, I do transformational wealth. So what I mean by this is a left to right concept where I go in and become an expert in real estate. I'm able to go do a million dollar deal. I convince my brother to get his real estate license. Now what he does is he gets a 30, a 3% commission. He gets $30,000. He, he and his wife and five children are able to buy a house in Abbotson, PA now, not 50 years from now, creating wealth. He's able to work with me again. He's uh, And then he makes more money. He's able to give his in-laws $8,000, $10,000 so they can do it as a gift for a down payment so they can buy a duplex. So now they're landlords today, not 50 years from now. So what happened is like my stepmom, I create LLCs. I give them equity at the table where they don't have to contribute any money. And as in exchange, they helped me run my business. Um, and so a lot of our students, my business partner, he has stuff in Indiana. He does not manage on his own. Um, we just go out and we evaluate property managers that we want to hire to help us uh, run our businesses. If you're not, um, if you're not the type of person that want to run the day to day. Okay. And I don't think you hire every family member, but what we need to start doing is we're willing to give complete strangers a second chance. We have to give our family members a second chance. Yeah. The reason why you don't give your family members a second chance is because you're too much in their business. You're <laughs> trying to figure out why they arguing with their girlfriend, why they spending money on a car. You don't know all that stuff about the complete strangers because yeah. you're not in their business. Yeah. So instead of trying to make people the best version of you, make let them become the best version of themselves. Meet people where they are. You can't expect people to be experts and expect people to operate and move the same way you you do. Um, people have unique experiences. Most, most, most definitely. Yeah, excellent, excellent, excellent point. Um, um, I want to jump back a little bit. When you're purchasing the properties, how, how you mentioned, you know, working with, uh, um, uh, you know, local uh, credit unions, you know, to the big banks. But how are you financing the deals? Is it all traditional lending? Is it hard money? Is it cash? No, I've never, I've never used, that's another reason why I took like the, the slow path over nine years to scale up because I wanted to become my own hard money lender. So I've never used hard money lending ever. Okay. Um, and so my, my thing was to use traditional lending where you put down 15%, 20%, 25%, 35%. Um, in the beginning, you want to put down the least amount of money because you don't have that much money. And as you get more successful, then you can you can tie up more money for down payments. Curious, why, why didn't you want to use hard money? Hard money is very expensive. A lot of people don't really understand this. So when you take out hard money loan, you're going to have to pay <clears throat> anywhere anywhere between two to four percent points. So say I'm taking out a hundred thousand dollars before I even do anything. They're going to make me at least pay $3,000, just, just points. Then on top of that, if I didn't have any experience, they're going to make me pay like about 12%. So that's another $12,000. I'm $15,000 in. Remember, I just borrowed a thousand, a hundred thousand. They're going to also charge me 2% for closing costs. So I got three, 3,000 from the points. I got 15%, well, 12% interest. So now I'm at 3,000 plus 12,000 plus another 2,000. So I'm already at, um, you got 12, three, two, we got five, two, we're at $17,000 I already paid. Then I have to, when I get the hard money loan, I have to pay them every time they come out for a draw. So that means that they may come out three or four times before they give me more money. Guess what? I got to pay another $1,000. So I'm already all in at $18,000. And all I did is borrow, um, all I did is borrow $100,000. 
I said, oh, hell no. I'm going to go broke. And don't yeah. let me be late. If I get late, I get penalized. I'd be damn near $20,000 all in. And I just borrow for every 100000 that I borrow. So therefore, that's why I decided not to use that route. Oh, okay, okay, got, got you, got you. Um, and so you, I know you mentioned, um, I think you mentioned you bought like a, so commercial, I know you purchased a couple commercial properties, is that correct? Like apartments and- um, That is true. So okay. I only own, um, what I did is I had purchased the individual houses. So I got nine individual houses and then I got five um, more houses. So they got me to 14. And recently I got, uh, I got two more. So that made me get to 16. So 16 individual houses. And then the remaining 92 units are apartment buildings. So I have a 24 unit apartment building. I have a 14 unit apartment building with a restaurant down below. I have two 12 unit apartment buildings. I have a nine unit apartment building. I have two six unit apartment buildings. I have a five unit apartment building. And then I have a triplex. Okay, thank you. Um, so how do you go about financing those commercial deals? I know a big part of commercial financing, especially with like apartments, is you need to have some sort of experience. So how do you go about? So uh, that's great because I have an a, apartment course in June um, where we, we explain the distinction between single families and uh, uh, buying five units and up, which is, a, which is apartment buildings. Mm -hmm. So when you buy the single family homes, the lender is focused on the quality of the borrower. Okay. So what I mean by that, they're focused on what is your income, how much you make, and how long you've been at the job, what is your credit profile and your score, uh, and then your debt to income ratio. How much are your expenses relative to your income? They're focused on those three things, income, credit profile and score, and your debt to income ratio. When you buy apartment buildings, five units and up, they're focused on, your, they're focused on the quality of the deal primarily. So what they want to do is make sure that that deal cash flow, the debt service coverage ratio has to be like a 1.25. So that means if your monthly rent, your net operating income is $1,250, that will be enough to cover a $1,000 a month of mortgage. That will pass the debt service coverage ratio requirement. The other thing they're going to want to know is do you have a guarantor? Someone on your team or you will have to be worth the equivalent of the mortgage, excluding your home. So if you're getting a million dollar loan, either you or someone on your team really have to have a net worth of a million dollars. The other thing you're going to say is someone on your team, either you or someone on your team has to have experience as an operator if you're going to buy an apartment building. Now, the bigger they are, the more experience they want. Now, if you're going to just buy your first five unit and you already bought a couple single units, the bank can be lenient because you probably already ran a business. Mm -hmm. But if you have absolute no experience, it's going to be hard to persuade a bank to give you a big loan because it's pretty risky. You might not know how to work with tenants. You may not have the net worth requirement. You may not have like three or six months of reserves in case something goes wrong. They're very, banks are very conservative. Okay. And so is that is that the same amongst, um, you know, your local credit union versus like a, a J.P. Morgan Chase or something like that? Is it does, does that commercial stuff vary from? Um, no, not pr primarily. The commercial stuff is primarily the same. It's going to be like the and also the, the individual stuff, the single families, one to four units is the same. The lender is focused on the quality of the borrower for the single family side. And if you're going to do the commercial side, they're focused on the quality of the deal. And then they want to make sure that you are that you or someone on your team can be a guarantor, or you or someone on your team has experience running a business or in real estate, because they're taking a risk and the loans are big. Got gotcha, got you, got you, got you. Thank you. Um, excuse me, sorry. And so, just curious, what, what's kind of the, the the end game for you? Is it just to keep buying properties, or is it to turn everything over to somebody, or like, is it? Do you so know at this point? So for me, the, and, and I, before I jump, I think that's the reason why, especially you see a lot of young people or a lot of people in their 40s or 50s on IG, they only own single families because they cannot meet the requirement to buy apartment buildings. If you okay. think about some of these people, they've been on for 10 or 20 years and they're like your, your real estate gurus, but you're like, why don't you own something bigger in your own name? Not mm -hmm. syndication where I own over 80% of my, my 108 units. 
but the other people, they just can't meet the requirements. Uh -huh. So therefore you got to stay in the little leagues and the single, uh -huh. anything wrong with the little leagues, you can make money. Um, but the end goal for me is, is that transformational wealth. It's not necessarily focused on me anymore. It's about like my business partner in 2018, he had zero units. Now he has over 60 doors. He wasn't a millionaire in 2018. Now he is. My brother who works with me and an owner in my uh, LLCs and my stepmom, my brother, he did not own a house before. Now he owns one. He's able to do certain things. Family members, friends. I want to make sure that I'm enabling them to increase their net worth and so that they can have that transformational wealth. Whether it's my contractor, I started an LLC with him. And so I can serve pretty much like his heart money lender versus him going out paying all these all high fees. We can have a partnership where I own 30%, he owns 70%, and I can be the bank, the bank for him. Um, so that is where I'm going. Like, of course, because I make so much money on a regular basis, I may buy more property. But for me, I want to elevate the people that are close to me. It's one thing if your friends and family can eat in the same zip code as you. It's another thing if they can live in the same zip code. And so well, that's what I want my legacy to be. Got you, got you, got you, got you. Thank you. Um. Well, that was a, that was a wealth of uh, information. Um, thank you. Just got got one final question. I always ask folks. Um, excuse me. So let's say I give you a million dollars. Um, you have to spend it on real estate or real estate adjacent items, and you have one week to spend it. What are you doing with the money? So, if you gave me a million dollars to buy real estate, real estate or something real estate related, just it can be you know. So for, so for me, I am. Um, bias towards um, apartment buildings because I think that the upside is just unlimited when you buy an apartment building. So I would probably use that as a 20% down payment on a very big property that I think that is a value add situation where I can do some repairs um, and increase the value. Um, so that would probably be my focus. Oh, okay, thank you. And that actually, <laughs> uh, so I guess that was not my last question. So um, I know you talked about you, um, when we, I think this is in our, our, our pre-interview, uh, we we're talking about, you know, rehabbing properties and, and stuff like that, doing rehab on the properties. Um, what, what are just some some quick tips on somebody that's evaluating, like maybe hiring a general contractor? Like what are the things you would look for when you're making sure, to, like at least your first property, you're trying to hire a general contractor. What do you, what do you look so for? What, so what we teach people in my course is we approach everything in real estate as if you are dating. So if you and I were about to date, I don't really know you that well. So therefore, the first thing we could do is go out for coffee. So I'm going to ask you questions. I may ask to see your work, may ask to see some of your licenses. I may actually ask to um, meet some of your clients, not just talk to them on the phone because you could be catfishing. So I want to <laughs> meet some of your clients and look at some of your work. Then what I'm going to do is after we've had a nice little, we got drinks and we went for a walk in the park. I'm liking you, you liking me. I'm going to invite you over to probably have lunch. And what I mean by lunch is I may give you a small project. I may let you fix the steps, but I'm not leaving you alone in my house. I'm going to pull up a chair. I'm going to pull up on you, see if you show up on time, see if you do a good job, if you clean up behind yourself and see if how your people work. And then I'm going to pay you because now, okay, we had coffee. Now we had lunch. Now I'm going to say, maybe you can go to dinner. And so <laughs> I invite you to another project and then if you may do the bathroom, you do a good job. And so now I'm like, yo, we might get serious. And if we get serious, then I give you more responsibility because we're not interested in one night stands. We want to marry you. Yeah. So a lot of people make it to the altar, but we don't get married. And so once I marry you, then I give you more responsibility. Um, we, we, you become, you get repeat business. So when you hungry, you ain't got to worry about it. You come right to me. I feed you. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that break, break down. Thank you. So where, where can the good folks find you? I know you mentioned you have a, um, a couple of courses. I know you teach folks how to do um, what you've done. So where can the folks find you? You can talk a little bit about, about what your courses are as well. Yes. So um, you can find me at KJ Consulting um, on IG. That's K-A-Y-J-A-Y-C-O-N-S-U-L-T-I-N-G. Also, our website is www. Uh, kjconsulting.net, N-E-T. Uh, we have a course coming up in June, our apartment course, where I teach you about syndication. I teach you about how to analyze deals. I teach you about the financing. 
I teach you about joint ventures. We do real case studies, reviewing the cases that I actually have done, deals I've done. So it's going to be real time. And what you do is that course is going to be for about six hours. And then what we give you is once a month, we do check-ins for the next 12 months, no additional costs. And we also give you a real estate apartment um, companion guide that you can reference. Um, my other course is going to be in July, and that is a single family course boot camp. Um, both courses are virtual. This is a virtual course. It will be from 1030 a.m. until 230 p.m. What we do is we teach you how to analyze markets, teach you how to analyze individual deals, teach you key terms, key concepts, and also give you key ratios. And um, we actually give you um, a companion guide, a real estate companion guide for that course, about 30 pages, ebook. And then what we do for both courses is we give you access to my entire team, realtors, brokers, agents, what have you. Um, and then we do once a month check-ins for the next 12 months. So both courses are very focused on helping you be successful. Um, and you can find those courses on by clicking the link in my bio on KJ Consulting on my IG page or go directly to my website. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. And um, if, whether you're listening on YouTube or the podcast, wherever, those will be in the, the, um, in the description as well. So um, once again, appreciate you uh, joining, joining us, you know, relaying the knowledge that you've, uh, of your story to the folks. Um, there is no outro to this show, so it is over. Thank you. All right. Thank you.